Hello, welcome back to another retro movie review. Uh, today we're going back to 1998 on the disaster movie Armageddon. Stick around, you don't want to miss a thing. <laughs> Yep, it's Armageddon time. I've decided to take a look at this film today. It's been on my radar to watch again for a little while. But with the news breaking last week about Bruce Willis and uh, the unfortunate fact that because of a terrible medical condition called aphasia, um, he is hanging up his spurs and giving up his acting career. It's a condition, as you've probably heard, that affects cognitive ability and the ability to speak and and respond and communicate with people. Of course, that's prime skill of an actor uh, and Bruce has had to step back his family issued this quite poignant statement um, it was something that actually has been sort of rumoured for a few months I'd heard various rumours that he wasn't well which explains a lot of the um, not very good low budget movies he's been appearing in the last few years I think it was apparently sort of a financial thing to get as much work under his belt as he could while he was able to but that's by the by uh, so I decided that not exactly a tribute, uh, but I wanted to watch a Bruce Willis film just to remind myself of of the man and the myth. Um, over the 30, 40 years he's been making films, and I look back at the films he's done, the films that I've got that I could look at, and he has really has been in a lot of great films. You're thinking of things like Sixth Sense, of course, which is um, one of his iconic first films. Um, one of my favourites is The Fifth Element, um, the Luke Besson mad science fiction film, um, 12 Monkeys, Terry Gilliam's film, and probably the last really good film he did was Looper, uh, Ryan Johnson's Looper, which you might remember I picked up Steelbook Edition of fairly recently, and I'm going to rewatch that soon because I haven't seen that for ages, and I know it's a very good film, a bit of a mind-bending film, but I'd need to watch that again, so I might well do a, a video on that one in due course. But I decided on Armageddon because it's one of those iconic films of the last century uh, in terms of the rebirth of the disaster movie. And I know that he gives a, a rousing performance in this film. And I think we forget that he is actually a very good actor. We think of the stuff he's churned out recently, the sort of well, almost like phoned in performances in these films, a lot of which I haven't seen, to be fair. But now we know why. The performances may be what they are and the films are what they are. But he was a proper film star, a proper, iconic, larger-than-life cinematic figure. So I picked Armageddon because I like disaster movies. Um, and I like those sorts of apocalyptic -y things. And as I realised, it's nearly a quarter of a century old. I probably haven't seen it for 20 years, so it was due a revisit. Uh, for the purposes of this video, as this film is nearly 25 years old, I'm assuming that if you watch this video, you've seen the film. If you haven't, there are going to be some spoilers. So let's crack on and talk about Armageddon. So, yeah, Armageddon, then. 1998, directed by Michael Bay and produced by Michael Bay, whose latest film, Ambulance, is out now. There's a review back that way. Uh, Michael Bay gets a lot of criticism, of course, for the uh, the Bayhem um, status of his films, which all bang and crash and loud and unsubtle. And that applies to Armageddon. It's not a subtle film. Um, it's not a... Uh, progressive film particularly in the, in the way we think of the word progressive cinematically these days but it's a damn fine mad um, highly unlikely science fiction action adventure film the premise of it as you probably know is that um, some routine work being conducted on the space station and the American space station suddenly uh, it is devastated by uh, some meteors uh, meteor storm uh, it's destroyed. Some of the meteors um, 
crashed to earth, caused all sorts of devastation around New York. NASA quickly realised that a massive planet killer sized uh, asteroid is on its way to Earth. Um, and it's going to crash land in Earth on Earth on 15 in, in 15 days, wiping out all living matter on Earth because this is such a huge thing. Um, it's going to just devastate and destroy everything. The only way to stop it is uh, to send up a top team of astronauts and miners up to the asteroid because it's a massive asteroid and plant a nuclear bomb deep in the core, 800 feet deep, to detonate it at the precisely the right moment, which will split it in half and send the two halves of the meteor, asteroid, meteor, yeah, meteor, <laughs> zooming off past the Earth. It's an impossible task, you might think, aha, but they've reckoned without Harry Stamper, played by old Brucey Boy. Uh, we meet him on this oil rig um, where he has just found out that his daughter, played by Liv Tyler, is having a bit of a relationship with AJ, uh, one of the uh, roughnecks on board the oil rig. He's played by a pretty young Ben Affleck. Uh, Bruce, Harry, doesn't approve. He thinks that she deserves better, but he's he hasn't reckoned on the fact that she's a young woman now. She's an adult. She can make her own choices. She can make her own decisions if she has to. Uh, whilst he doesn't approve of the uh, relationship, there's not much he can do about it. Now, bearing in mind he's a very experienced miner and he's he's been drilling for 30-odd years and he knows what's what, he then sets about um, chasing AJ all over the oil rig and shooting at him. So bullets are flying off these pipes and in this extremely inflammable um, facility, which seems a bit reckless, but there we are. That's what people do. So that's what dads do, I imagine. Suddenly, the government officials rock up and uh, tell him that tells Harry that um, he's needed. Sorry, it's just started absolutely hammering it down. Really, so you might be able to hear it. Um, they whip him back to Washington, well, wherever, to, where NASA inform him what's going on. And that as the world's most renowned and successful driller, he's the only person who can save the world. Um, he decides that he wants his team about him, the best drillers in the business, which as usual motley sort of crew that you get in these sorts of films. We've got Luke Wilson, we've got Michael Clark Duncan, Steve Buscemi is the comic relief. Um, and inevitably, um, Ben Affleck comes on board with, as AJ. The first 40, 45, 50 minutes of the film, a sort of a training montage of these these roughnecks who've got no experience, who've got uh, 12 days to be trained as astronauts, uh, which is highly unlikely and pretty much impossible. We've seen recently film, I remember Moonfall, which um, posits an equally silly idea about people who've never been to space, who jump on board a spaceship and go into space to save the Earth. Uh, this has a little bit more to it, I suppose. It, you know, stretch a point, you can imagine NASA putting out all the stops to get the people they need up to a required standard to get them into space. Uh, this sort of happens. Uh, the team bond. Uh, there's another team of more experienced astronauts. So these two shuttles are sent off into space uh, to rendezvous with the Mir space satellite where they'll refuel. When they get there, there's a terrible accident. Uh, the Mir station's blown up and uh, there are casualties and uh, lots of high adventure takes place, which continues to take place when they do finally make their way to this meteor, which is hurtling towards the Earth. There's another accident. One of the ships crashes 28 miles away from where it should be, which leaves the other team, led by Bruce, to save the day on their own with severely depleted resources and depleted numbers. And all manner of explosive, noisy things happen while they're up on the meteor. Uh, things go wrong. Uh, there are explosions. Things fly around. There are guns. <laughs> um, the other shuttle that's crashed, there are some survivors, including luckily AJ, uh, they use this sort of roving machine called an armadillo to try and travel across the surface of this meteor to get back to the others. Um, and it's very tense, it's very exciting, it's very loud. So much is going on um, and it's all nuts. And at points you sort of think, what exactly is going on? Because things are flying around and things are exploding and people in spacesuits are hurtling around the place. But it's sort of, it's not incredibly difficult to keep hold of, keep track of because it's just, it's just daft. It's completely daft. I mean, at the time when this came out, the same year, you may remember the film Deep Impact, which um, is possibly a um, better film. That's more of a sort of political, familial sort of disaster movie rather than the balls-to-the-wall action of this one. Um, and, and that's probably more scientifically accurate than this one. But this is more fun. This is sort of 
it's corny. I mean, you look at it now and you think, yeah, it does all those corny things, you know, the relationshipy things. AJ bonding with Harry in the end and down on earth, Liv Tyler in a fairly thankless role as the daughter, Grace. Um, getting very upset at the thought of her father not coming back and AJ not coming back. And, you know, she has to run the gamut of... So it's not a lot for her to do. But all in all, I had a good time with this. It's it's crazy. It's implausible. It's impossible. Uh, one thing to point out, of course, as I said, it's 25 years old, and that's sort of a lifetime in terms of visual effects. But the visual effects are still pretty good. There's a couple of slightly dodgy green screen sequences. But all in all, visually, it's it's still pretty impressive. The effects still look good, considering this is sort of not exactly the early days of CGI, but compared to today's sort of magic that they can conjure it's sort of you know it's still a learning curve but the sea effects still are good the space stuff is good this scene where new york um is uh showered with meteors and there's cars flying everywhere and buildings crumbling still looks pretty good there's one sequence towards the end where uh some of the meteors get through the atmosphere and just paris is just casually wiped off in this huge explosion you think yeah that's a shame, really. At the end of the film, you know, it's not a huge spoiler to say that the Earth is saved. No one's hugely worried about the fact that the capital of France and has lost millions of people and been destroyed. It's not really mentioned. But that's fairly typical in American sort of action disaster films, where it's all about America and American people and the rest of the world. It's sort of uh, a slight inconvenience. But generally, it's a good film. It's got a really good cast. As I said, you've got Bruce on fine form in a sort of big macho hero role that he plays so well. Um, young Ben Affleck, Liv Tyler, Billy Bob Thornton as well, the NASA Chiefs, um, Steve Buscemi. It, it's it's just a good cast of good, solid, four-square American action heroes. And there's a bit of narration at the beginning, of course, about how this has happened before, uh, which is by the late Charlton Heston, which is really good to hear him because, of course, he had a history of doing sort of big science fiction films during the 60s and 70s. So all in all... I think he stood the test of trying quite well. I mean, if you go into it, bearing in mind that it's made in 1997, 1998, um, what's quite nice, it hasn't got the sensibility that you get with today's films where you sort of think that certain casting decisions or story decisions and things are very much based on the expectations that are foisted upon society, should we say, where certain things have to happen, whether they're good for the story and the film or not. But this is Michael Bay, who doesn't really follow us. Even now, he doesn't particularly care about that sort of stuff. Uh, this is blokes being blokey in space. And I think it's all the better for it, to be honest. It's good fun. Um, I'm not, not going to say it's mindless. No, it's not, because it's, uh, you know, even though the emotional stuff is, you know, predictable, it is still quite emotional. The, the ending is quite, you know, quite emotional when I'm not going to spoil it just in case you haven't seen it, but you know, the, the plot takes a turn that you can sort of see coming, but it's when it happens, it's exciting and it's quite poignant and it's altogether a pretty good film. And of course it features Aerosmith's rock classic. I don't want to miss a thing. Uh, so that's Armageddon, which is my, not exactly a tribute to Bruce Willis, but just the Bruce Willis film of choice that I decided to look at this afternoon. It's pretty rainy, horrible, um, Wednesday, I forget what day it is half the time, uh, Wednesday here in South Wales, and I've knocked myself away in the cinema room, and I had a couple of enjoyable hours watching Armageddon. You should do it too. Right, I'm going to give Armageddon for pure fun and madness 8.5 out of 10. It's not a classic film, it's not a great film, but in terms of, you know, fairly modern um, apocalyptic adventure disaster films it's it still holds up so i recommend it you take a look at it if you've either not seen it or not seen it for years right thank you for watching hopefully i'll be back with more stuff very very soon until i do oh like and subscribe that would be nice it would be nice uh leave a comment all that sort of stuff until i see you next time you know what to do that's right you've got to keep taking the stuff mm -hmm.